Thought I'd show you some of the different types of motor that I've been finding in Porter Studios and things. I've been taking these things apart for a while. Various manufacturers, late 70s through the late 90s. So there's a bit of variety in how these things are put together. This first style we're looking at is what you would find in likes of Tascam 244, 234, um, 246. Pretty sure that the motor... Can't let me look over here, I've got one. It's not exactly the same, but the TX 144 motor, the main capstan motor anyway. These capstan motors all look a bit like this, so they're fairly large. And uh, they've got some sort of motor control chip screwed to the outside of the casing, being used as a heat sink. Screw one side, tab the other. So you unscrew that, you push in this tab and you gently pry here. It's going to come away. There's going to be foam here to stop any of these electrical contacts shorting against this part of the case. This one's still soldered in. And here's one. What's that? I think that's a 244. Yeah, this is the 244 servo. So if you desolder two pairs of pads here, then you can remove that. So what you've got is actually a motor within a motor. I've never actually got as far as opening one of these up. Usually the pulley on these is held on really, really tight. I believe I would have to get some sort of metal clamp and a heat gun and uh, really heat that up in order to release the adhesive that's inside there. I'm trying to think who it is. Is it 12 volt vids? So somebody like that, a YouTuber. I've seen them do something similar where they've removed the pulley from a reel to reel motor and they, that's what they had to do. They had to get a heat gun, put it on there for two minutes. Um, the motor's held in a metal clamp and then you could pry it off with the screwdriver. But, I mean, if I try and do this. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly strong guy. You can see that's just pushing that, you know, that's not going to come off by itself. And here's the servo inside the 246, uh, the ch chips and the layout is slightly different. And then this is from a Porter 1, it'll be the same motor that's in the Porter 2. Same sort of idea, but again, uh, it's different chips. In this case, the motor control chip, that'll be that one is inside rather than on the outside of the casing. When I say motor control chip, I'm not speaking from a very knowledgeable base, but you know, a rough layman's idea of what it does is it's just kind of compensating for the variations in speed. I think there's some sort of feedback from the brushes. So, I mean, it's, it does what a voltage regulator does for voltage, except it's doing it for the speed of the motor. So if you've got like excessive, you know, warble pitch problems, uh, with your tape machine and it's definitely not like any of the mechanical parts like the pinch roller or idlers or the belts then that will often be a sign that the chip here is dying you know, it's overheating hasn't quite cut out completely here's a Mbucci eg 510kd2b you can see that although it's a slightly larger caliber it's deeper and uh, this kind, which is what you find in all the later Tascams. And really from the 44 series onwards, that grey generation, the dark grey generation, the blue generation after that, have all got this format of motor. Um, but the holes do line up. So you can see this is like rated for 3,200 revolutions per minute. That means that it will do three and three quarter inches per second. You know, it depends which model it is, whether there's going to be space. But if there's enough physical space, you can you can um, substitute one of these 510KD2B for one of these 530KD2B if you've got that extra centimetre at the top there. I'm trying to think which model I did it with. I think it was probably a 464, which had a dead one of these. This was before I had learned to replace the motor chip in these, which is the subject of some videos that I've published before. I've been able to buy these off Tinterweb, the old stock, and put one of those in instead but I'm showing you that because you can see that that's a bit like the Porter 1 motor there's another motor inside there in this case um, it's just a slip-on plastic 
pulley that goes on there so that you can actually remove that. I suppose actually I could take this apart at some point and see what's inside, whether it's similar to the guts of this kind. Motor control chip that's on there, although the layout of the PCB is different than it is the same motor control chip as this and it's the same pin layout for these, which is why it works as a direct substitute. So let's move on to this format. Like I say, we begin to see this port 05 and port 07 actually, that's the earliest ones. It's not the grey generation, so the little um, portable ones that they started bringing out towards the end of the 80s, the Tascam start uses this sort of format of motor. And um, when I say this format of motor, there's two kinds of servo PCBs. A servo PCB, I mean this. I mean, this is a little printed circuit board that's inside it that houses the motor control chip and all the supporting cast of components that it will need. This is actually from a Matushita. I'll check the name of that in a second. It's just the first one of these I could grab to hand. You also get this format where there's only two input pins and the servo in there. I'll compare that with the PCB from one of these... 530 KD 2Bs in a minute, but it's the difference in these little servo boards and the number of input pins that determines whether these are suitable for only 1 in 7 8 inches per second. That's you know the commercial speed that your home stereo cassette player would play at, and the higher speed of 3 and 3 quarter inches per second for higher fidelity. Right, these armatures, commutator at the top, they're pretty much interchangeable for all of these motors. Some of them, the shafts are longer or shorter to accommodate wider or thinner pulleys. I did a blog post a while ago. I mean, I, my blog, I'm afraid, is a bit of a ghost town. Um, I haven't really done much with it, but one of the few articles I did put any effort into is uh, one that I wrote when I was first kind of getting into figuring out what was going on with these motors. And in that, I think I said that I thought that the direction of winding of this copper wire around the armature determined whether these are in clockwise or counterclockwise direction and that's definitely bollocks. Uh, what I've discovered through experimentation that it is actually the orientation of the brushes. So let's see if I can get an obvious visual example. Okay hopefully you can see that. So I mean basically this little plastic housing is exactly the same. This one's discoloured because obviously smokes come from a overheated motor control chip, so that's why it's looking sort of yellow and brown. Um, but I think you can see that they've both been made from pretty much the same mould. But hopefully what you can see, this one labelled counterclockwise, I put CCW on it with Sharpie. And the brushes, that's these parts here, um, so they uh, touch this part which is called the commutator and uh, that's how the electricity is passed this that becomes an electromagnet and therefore it spins inside the fixed magnets inside here um, on the counterclockwise the brushes are orientated like that but here on the clockwise one they're orientated like that so these are interchangeable these houses are interchangeable you know it doesn't matter whether it's high speed low speed clockwise or counterclockwise fake ones or the original ones, I'll come to that in a minute, all the, the, these parts are totally fungible, fungible, I'm not sure how to pronounce that word. These are going to be the same moulding, whether it's a copy or a real Machibichi or a slow one or a fast one, but the orientation of the brushes dictates whether the motor is going to rotate in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. And if you think about that, hopefully if you've seen on some of the videos in this channel, you've seen some transports where the motor goes from the back and somewhere the motor is mounted from the front. The capstan always wants to turn counterclockwise, so it draws the tape from left to right uh, from the supply reel to the take-up reel. Um, but obviously, in order to achieve that capstan, rotation direction, whether the motor turns in clockwise or counterclockwise direction is going to be different depending whether you're mounting the motor from the front the way you would do in a Porto 07 or from the back the way you would do on a 464. So anyway, that's what the brushes look like, that's what the commutators look like, that's what the casing look like. Let's talk about copies and Originals. This is a cheap Chinese copy. It's got a Mabuchi symbol on it. I don't know if they've actually bought up the intellectual property for that company or not, but uh, the sticker is stuck directly onto the case. And here's the original, and the sticker is on a sort of like 
metal winding. The real original ones have got this plate with the Mabuchi Motor logo embossed into it, whereas the cheap copies, that's actually substantially thin of that metal, but you can see it's plain. It's just got a plus and minus, whereas this has got plus minus AB for the four inputs on it. And you can see inside, although functionally they are the same, the fixed magnet here is seamless on the original, whereas there's this little seam here. I found in practice that isn't actually going to alter the performance. What you do need to watch for, occasionally on like things like eBay you'll see um, 530KD2B, you know, that's the one that's in most of the high-speed Tascam Porter Studios being sold as new, and what you'll find is they're like this with no metal band on them, they've got the sticker stuck directly to the chassis, and when you open them the servo which dictates the speed is a completely different design, and that servo is not very good at maintaining three and three quarter inches per second reliably. If you had like an original motor with mechanical problems but a good servo then you can definitely take the servo from the original and put it in a casing like this and it would work. But the servos that come with these cheap ones are the kind of crap, kind of dog shit. Yeah so the, I mean they look like this. It's a different serial number of motor controlled shift and they've got a little variable resistor in there. I suppose that's to change the base speed. I mean, I've got a few of these <laughs> that are really charred. This is the problem that you have. Um, these C1470 motor control chips get really hot. They're dissipating the heat via a little spring to the plate on the back of the motor, like this. Basically, you can see there's a cutout in the foam that stops these pins shorting out against the cap. That will be pushed up like that. This kind, the original, with a fresh C1470 chip. And you can still buy them, new old stock from eBay and so on. That's going to produce three and three quarter inches per second reliably. This, despite the variable resistor, in my experience, isn't. Anyway, so that's that generation of Mabuchi motor. Anyway, uh, there are a couple of other companies producing motors in about that size. That first servo board I was showing you, and that actually came from this. This I think this is Machu Picchu. I'm probably slaughtering the Japanese, but there's kind of three Japanese companies making these. You've got Mabuchi, Machu Picchu, and uh, Sankyo. Here's the Machu Picchu offering in that format. And again, you can see this one. This one came from a MT Atex, but I've also seen exactly this motor in the Marantz PMD 740. It's got green paint on the wire on the uh, armatures, the electromagnets, but that's superficial. It's got quite a long shaft because the pulley for that model is pretty big, but it's a different uh, control chip. This part coming out of the board is wider, like that will not fit that gap from the Machibichi is, is too narrow so you can't swap the servos over between them unfortunately. Um, also the Machibichi the way it's connecting to earth is there's a little pin in this gap and that's how it uh, joins onto the board whereas on this this little tab here lines up like that and then you solder that that's how it connects to earth it might be how the heat from this chip dissipates. So that's their variant of it. And then Sankyo also did one of this sort of size and format. And this is this SHU2L. This is the only one of these I've had. I know it's dead, so I just opened it on a, for a laugh and I was desoldering all these different contacts. It actually turned out when I pried it off that it was completely unnecessary. You can see they've gone for a completely different design where the brushes, which are now wrecked, <laughs> are attached to the servo board. So I think this space in here is so you can get like a paper clip or pliers or so on. Sort of pry, basically pry those brushes apart if you need to take that apart. When I say I've wrecked it, what I mean is I've just pulled that off without opening up the brushes there. I didn't realize that. I was expecting there to be a separate cap, you know, one of these under there. I didn't realize it was going to be a completely different anatomy. But yeah, I can assume that all the Sankyo motors are of that format where the brushes and the server are all on the same sort of plastic housing. The size of the gap here is different to these other kinds. You see there's three different sizes of gap. 
I just want to see if there's the commutator from the Sanko will fit in here. And uh, actually the diameter of the commutator is slightly wider for the Sanko, so they're not interchangeable. And um, you can see that the fixed magnet inside the Sanko is a bit thinner than that one. Yeah, so that's it. Pretty nerdy, but hopefully some sort of insight for some of y'all who are deep in the sickness, the sickness of fixing these things. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.